PC. One second. You should be able to push with the mouse, but look at me if it doesn't work. Uh, See if I can get on the screen. So thanks everyone for inviting me back. Um, this talk is supposed to be about DEC late health issues, I think that was the title. Broadly speaking. Yes, and thank you for the broadly speaking. <laughs> uh, this will be a broadly speaking talk. Uh, so DEC lake related issues, as you'll hear in a couple minutes, is really one. Uh, all of our life since I was last year has been consumed by one issue. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about a few other issues that are at least peripherally related. So the focus of this talk is first some really specific information and some general statewide information about uh, aquatic invasive species, long-term water quality issues, and HABs. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie, who's going to talk a little bit about the issue that has consumed us over the last year, which is the statewide harmful algal blooms or HABs initiative. So I, I don't want to dismiss the idea that aquatic invasive species continue to be an important issue. We just spent a lot of this morning talking about this issue. Recognizing that, at least from Division of Water's perspective where I work, um, it has not been a priority over the last year. Again, for reasons that you'll hear about in a few minutes. Um, so just a couple of key highlights. We've heard hydrilla, and hydrilla continues to be the focus of DECs efforts about aquatic invasive plants, in particular, but aquatic invasive species overall. Um, we're still continuing to work with the federal government to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on three infestations in New York State. Croton River, um, the Cayuga Lake area, and the Erie Canal area. There are about 25 other places in New York State in which hydrilla has been found, including a couple this year as well. Um, there are more than 400 places in New York State where we found Eurasian water milk foil, more than 200 places where we found curly pondweed, and so on and so on and so on. So hydrilla, in terms of the big scheme, is a minor player in terms of its statewide distribution. But it is the primary focus in New York State for a lot of the reasons that you've heard at the summit for many years. We want to prevent it from getting into more places. We don't want the statewide Eurasian water milk foil map to become the hydrilla map. We don't want it in 400. And we're early enough in that process that we're making significant inroads. Now that said, and Bob can talk more about this because you're fortunate to be collaborating with probably the world's expert on Manisha's hydrilla. Um, it takes a lot of effort to keep this in check. And while we've been extraordinarily successful in Kaiga Inlet, for example, um, it is still creeping out of that area and has made its way into other places in Kaiga Lake. So we're being extraordinarily effective but we have to stay vigilant with that. Um, it's also worth noting that the DEC unit that oversees that, that whole process, the Invasive Species Coordination Unit, which is part of the Division of Lands and Forest, they've had significant staffing changes over the last year or so. So for those who are collaborating with Albany, you may have a whole bunch of new players here. And that's all I'm gonna talk about with Invasive Species. Um, so, Long-term water quality trends, which I've talked about a couple times when I've been at this summit, and I'll talk a little bit about today as well. That's getting closer to the issue of concern, which, uh, spoiler alert, is harmful algorithms. That's been an enormous focus of our attention over the last year or so. So long-term water quality trends plays a significant role in that. Um, so let's get right into what we know about Casanova Lake. As many of you know, perhaps even all of you know, Casanova Lake has been sampled every year as part of our volunteer lake monitoring program, the Sea Slap program, which is um, a terrific program. I've been running it for 30 years, um, and I'm fortunate enough to hand this program off to Stephanie. Um, so, what are some of the things that we're learning in that program? Well, the plot up here shows the long term change in phosphorus concentrations in Casanova Lake. Why am I picking on phosphorus? because phosphorus is the driver of a lot of what we see in lakes. Increased phosphorus, you're going to increase the amount of algae or cyanobacteria. You may also create conditions in which nuisance aquatic plants, invasive species, do particularly well. 
Um, and if you can see from the plot here that from when we started sea slop in Casanova Lake in 1988 until around 1996, 1997, it was a pretty steady um, measurement of phosphorus concentration in the lake. Then things started going a little bit haywire. Um, is that specific to Casanova Lake? Um, probably not. Um, we saw relatively steady conditions in New York State lakes for many years, and then we're seeing greater variability. One of the things that this may very clearly demonstrate is that the, the environment in which the lake resides, quite literally the environment, is changing. Um, that you see a change in the amount of rainfall that's coming into the lake, the duration of the rainfall, the timing of it, so more significant rain events followed by longer drought periods. So you see greater variation. But if you look at the trends in water quality since about the late 1990s, we've seen a pretty steady increase. Um, so that's the red line here. Um, it is, from a statistical perspective, it is not a very clear relationship. You see bouncing around from one year to another. But overall, we're seeing an increase in phosphorus concentrations. And one of the consequences of that is the lake is more susceptible to some water quality problems. If you look at Casanova Lake relative to what we're seeing in New York State, um, this is a complicated plot, and I'm not going to go into the details of how it's generated, but basically it's a mechanism to compare Casanova Lake to other lakes. We can't just say, what are the phosphorus concentrations in Casanova Lake compared to the other lakes that we're sampling, because the lakes that we sample every year are different, and you're comparing it apples to oranges. So this is a way to do it apples to apples. So I want to highlight a couple things here. One is that that trend that we've seen in Casanova Lake an increase since about the late 1990s to the early 2000s to the present day, we're seeing that in New York State as well. That's the black line. The magnitude of that change, or the, the, the extent of that variability, um, seems to be greater in Casanova Lake than we see broadly in New York State. However, if you pick out any one lake and do the same plot, you would often see the same thing as well. Greater variability, a, a greater scope of change in any one lake, including that lake. <laughs> also note that the years that, that phosphorus concentrations are higher in Casanova Lake, they were also higher in many New York State lakes, and higher in many lakes broadly in this area, Madison County, Central. So what that's also saying is the factors that are causing changes in phosphorus concentration in Casanova Lake are probably affecting other lakes as well, which points to weather being a big significant driver of what we're seeing. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at is the phosphorus concentrations, not the surface of the lake, but the bottom of the lake. And we've seen actually um, a tightening of that data. It's the, the variability between what's going on in the top and what's going on in the bottom seems to be decreasing, but it's still higher in the bottom, which is telling us, as you've heard in some of the previous summits, phosphorus is probably coming from within the lake itself, a source of phosphorus that continues to feed what we're seeing in the lake. Um, one of the things that we're also looking at, we just started looking at in CSLAP this year, is the form of phosphorus. So what we're measuring both in the top and the bottom is what we refer to as total phosphorus. Soluble phosphorus, suspended phosphorus, biologically available phosphorus, phosphorus that's not available for algae growth. We're starting to look at forms of that phosphorus as well. That's one of the great benefits that's come from this harmful algal blooms initiative. We have access to more money now. So we're saying, oh, while we got more money, let's start looking at the things that we've never had the resources to support um, and hire them some more staff and do some other good things. So we're starting to get a, cl a clearer picture of what's going on in, in some of these things. So phosphorus, you add phosphorus to the lake, there is an impact to the lake. What are some of those impacts? Well, the one that we're most concerned about is water clarity. Um, is it affecting the measurements of water clarity, which itself is a surrogate for a lot of other things. And over time, since 1988, we haven't seen as clear a trend, but since about the late 1990s, we've seen a st relatively steady decrease in water clarity. Seems to match up with what we're seeing in terms of phosphorus concentration. So those two things seem to be in alignment with each other. Um, and again, 
Generally, what we're seeing in Casanova Lake, we're also seeing in other places in the state as well. But it is not absolutely, every time we see it in Casanova Lake, we're seeing it in the central New York lakes, or we're seeing it in New York State lakes. Most times, we see a comparability. What's happening in Casanova seems to be happening in other places, but not every year. And that's because every lake is unique. They behave a little bit differently, even looking at weather, for example. If weather is driving what we're seeing here, yeah, a change in weather in central New York might be affecting all of those, lifting all of the boats up, if you will. But weather patterns in Lake Moraine, the right way, Lake Moraine down the road here, might be very different than the weather patterns we're seeing here. And we're seeing these micro storms, um, these localized events that are causing one lake but to, to change, but not necessarily the one that might be five miles away from it. The other thing which is complicating is I made a leap there. I went from phosphorus to water clarity. There's an intermediate step in there. When you add phosphorus to the water, it increases the amount of algae that's in the water. We measure that by something called chlorophyll A. And we have not seen a trend in chlorophyll A like we've seen for phosphorus or water clarity. So there are complications to this. It may be that this measure is not accurately telling us the amount of algae that's growing in the lake. Um, and, and we've seen that in some other water bodies as well. It may be that the way uh, algae is measured is not representative of what's going on in the lake. And for those of you who have seen a bloom show up on your shoreline, but it looks crystal clear at the center of the lake, well, no, there's not necessarily a strong connection between those. So a few other things to, to comment on as well. Um, we've started to see some interesting changes in conductivity, which is basically a measurement of everything that you can measure in the water, all of the ions that are in the water, um, that over time we've seen an increase in conductivity, not necessarily in each year, but the long-term trends, which is the bottom left plot here. Um, we've seen from the, the mid-1980s all the way to the present day an increase in conductivity. Um, it is probably the clearest trend that we've seen across New York State in river systems and in lake systems. Um, we've also seen the plot here on the, on the right is a change in temperature. I talked a little bit without saying specifically about climate change. Uh, one of the ways that we can measure climate change is lakes is look at water temperatures. Um, 1986 corresponds to when we started the sea slot program. If we had had the foresight to start that in 1950, we would probably have been seeing even a clearer trend here as well. So we're seeing an increase in temperature. If you look at just a group of lakes that are sampled every year from the 1980s to the present day, on average, we've seen a temperature increase of about one degree per decade over that period of time. So we're seeing an increase in water temperature. Um, and we're seeing that, that change mostly in the surface. We're not really yet seeing it in the bottom waters, but that may be changing over time as well. So that is sort of the broad picture about water quality changes in New York. Um, why we're concerned about that is many reasons, but this one is really what's driving an awful lot of our dialogue in New York City. Harmful lot of problems. It is the topic now. Um, and I'll turn it over to Stephanie a little bit later to talk about some very specific initiatives that are ongoing. Um, but let's start talking about what we know about harmful lot of problems in New York City. So, this is a table showing um, the results of our harmful algal bloom program. That program is routine sampling in the 175 lakes that are sampled in CSLAP, our statewide program, our own sampled water bodies, and surveillance networks that we've set up on the Finger Lakes, New York City, Long Island, a whole bunch of other places. So there are several hundred lakes every year that we're documenting blues. And we've seen from 2012 until about 2016 a pretty steady increase in the number of blooms that we've documented in New York City. So the map up here shows in 2012, the first year we really first started documenting this, um, the distribution of blooms in New York State. By 2013, we'd added more places. Same thing in 14, same thing in 15, same thing in 16, and we're starting to fill in the New York State map. And 2016, uh, here in 2017, when you accumulate all of what we saw from 2012 to 2017, you see lots and lots of blooms in New York State. Um, you also see some holes in the state as well. So some of the holes in the Catskills, for example, 
this area. Um, we don't really know whether or not blooms are significant there because our monitoring programs, unfortunately, really haven't addressed the area. We also see a hole here in the Adirondacks. That's a real hole. Blooms are not as common in the Adirondacks, and it gets back to why the start of this conversation is phosphorus. Phosphorus concentrations are much lower in the Adirondacks for many reasons, and we see fewer blooms. But it's not none. And some of these places still have low phosphorus concentrations, yet we're getting blooms anyway. And it's getting to why we're so confounded by this issue. The relationship between phosphorus and blooms is really pretty clear except when it isn't. And there are unfortunately an increasing number of places when it isn't, that we're seeing blooms that we don't expect to see blooms. The places where we have really high phosphorus concentrations, Putnam County, Westchester County, Long Island, gobs of blooms. But in a lot of other places, we haven't seen them. And then in an increasing number of places, like by 2017, every one of the Finger Lakes, we didn't expect to see blooms there. Yet we're starting to see them. We're just now finalizing the numbers in 2018, so we haven't remapped this yet. But just looking at the numbers that as of the end of October, we documented in New York, 2016, 174, 2017, 168, 2018, 174. That's the same number, basically. So it seems to have plateaued, or has it? So if you look at that distribution of when we had bloom reports in each one of those years plotted over the course of the calendar, the black line corresponds to 2018. And you're seeing the same trend in every year, which is an increasing number of blooms, cyanobacteria blooms, peaking in August or September, and then starting to decrease. Um, and uh, if you were to actually be able to see the details of the colors, you'd see Fewer in 2012, more in 13, more in 14, more in 15, and so on starting to plateau. And it appears that 2018 is the highest of all of them. But if you actually look at the percentage of places where we're looking, not just the total number, the percentage, it really isn't very different. It seems to be pretty consistent year after year. So a lot of what you're seeing on the left is we're just looking for it in more places. If we had the ability to look at every one of the 16,000 lakes and ponds and reservoirs in New York State, that number would probably be much, much higher than this. Um, that said, I think we've documented more blooms in New York State than any other place in the country, in part because we have a lot of people on the ground looking. Sorry, I keep, keep losing my cursor here. Um, if you look in Casanova Lake, um, in 2018, in the open water, sea slab samples collected in the center of the lake, we didn't see blooms. We saw, over the course of the summer, um, a higher percentage of each one of those samples having cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, the blue in here, toward the end of the summer and into the fall. We started seeing an increasing amount of blue-green algae in the open water, but not at bloom quantities. That steady increase in blueness, blue-greenness, is consistent with what we just said on, showed on the statewide basis. Bloom, cyanobacteria blooms are more likely hitting in August and September than they do earlier in the year. But fortunately, at least out in the center of the lake, we really weren't seeing that in the samples. We did see blooms occur along the shoreline in Casanova Lake. Um, a couple of early samples that were collected were not really cyanobacteria, and they didn't have real high algae levels. But in July and in September, and we know based on some beach closures, we started seeing some blooms along the shoreline. Uh, if you look at the statewide distribution map of where beach closures occurred, the plot on the left, the bars show a steady increase in beach closures associated with HABs. Some of that is because there are probably more HABs, and some of it is we're doing a better job of looking for it. Um, and as was talked about a little bit earlier, the state protocol, health department protocol, for beach closures has really been anchored down over the last couple of years. It's more consistently applied across the state. Um, if you look at the number of days lost to beach closures, um, on average, that really hasn't changed a lot from one year to another. We're just documenting it in more places. In Casanova Lake, which is the green line, some years we haven't had beach closures at all. Other years, there have been. So I'm going to close with 
why we're really getting into a lot of this. Um, there have been some very high profile blooms. Many of you have probably heard about them. All 11 Finger Lakes were in bloom simultaneously last fall. This year, 10 of the 11, one of the Rochester drinking water reservoirs was not in bloom, but every one of them were. Skinny Atlas was in bloom again this year. In 2018, in the finished drinking water for Canandaigua Lake, for the first time, we were detecting toxins. Uh, not at a real high level, but a high enough level that they actually had to shut down the drinking water supply for a short period of time. So, some alarming findings. The other one which is of particular concern is nearly 100 water bodies in New York State in mid-September this year were in bloom simultaneously, the highest number that we've ever seen. Part of that is because we're looking more, part of it may be a real change that's occurring. So this has prompted an awful lot of state effort. So in a second, Stephanie will talk a little bit about this process. There have been some good things that come out of this. I was able to hire Stephanie, which is great, um, bringing in a new CSLAP board here. Uh, for those who have not heard, I'm retiring in the spring. Um, and I'm thrilled that we have some additional people that are going to come help with this. Um, but to some extent, it's a little sad because things are getting, from a pure scientific perspective, really exciting. <laughs> really starting to get an understanding of this. And I hope Stephanie's going to call me every so often and say, guess what we learned now? Um, but she'll talk a little bit about what we're doing now to learn a little bit more now. So let me turn it over to Stephanie June. Um, for those who do not know Stephanie, um, she was just brought in in April to take over the CSLAB program and eventually take on more responsibilities. She has a bachelor's degree in biology and marine science from Northeastern, and a master's in public health from the State Health Department. I've known her for a couple of years, but we just hired her in April. I'm thrilled that she's taking over the program. So, take it. Thank home. you. Um, happy to be here, and as Scott said, he's retiring, and he's dumping all of his massive workload on me. <laughs> so I will try to pick up that big burden, but I'm happy to do it. And we'll start with, like Scott said, one of our priorities this past year has been HAPS. And a lot of this came to fruition in the in January of 2018. Uh, for those of you that know, every year Governor Cuomo gives a State of the State address. Uh, and in this 2018 address, he announced an initiative for HAPS, specifically $65 million dedicated to uh, researching HAPS, innovative strategies for mitigating have impact, uh, a whole host of things. Uh, I think it was a four-point initiative, but really there's kind of five aspects of this. Uh, there's identifying priority water bodies to look at specific uh, impacts, pollution sources, uh, responses in the water body and in the watershed uh, to help identify any areas where we could target for intervention strategies, basically. Uh, also, there were regional summits. There were four. There were in Syracuse, uh, Rochester, Ticonderoga, and New Paltz. Uh, this was all preceding me being hired, but I will give you the background that I, I've been told. Uh, there's also action plans created for each of those water bodies. And we also are working for advanced monitoring techniques with USGS. And uh, as I'll go into a little bit in more detail, it's the mitigation pilot project. So actually trying to implement mitigation strategies on these water bodies for potentially curbing the impacts of HABs. Uh, and this initiative in general was follow up to kind of a spur up of uh, overall water quality initiatives that the governor's been implementing and putting forth. So we're happy that HABs has been at the forefront of that as well because it's created a lot of opportunities for us to do more research and to collaborate more with uh, statewide and national experts. So as I said, the first initiative, or first point in the initiative was to select the priority water bodies. There were 12 that were selected. This luckily did not fall on me uh, because there are 16,000 ponded waters in New York State and we have a lot of data for a lot of those lakes. So to actually select 12 priorities is a very difficult task. But what the uh, people tasked with that tried to do was to get a wide variety of uh, water body types, sizes, different locations geographically around the state. So you'll see they're distributed in the lower to mid Hudson Valley, western New York, central New York, and then also North Country Lake Champlain watershed. Uh, so all of these were also water bodies that are critical to tourism and potentially water supplies, drinking water supplies. So uh, definitely a great 
wide berth of water bodies to investigate further and to get some more detailed analysis on. So as uh, I also mentioned, there were four HAB summits. So this was a, a collaborative effort with the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture and Markets to bring together national and state experts. Uh, some of those experts are in this room. There's Scott on both of those panels. <laughs> I'm trying to embarrass him just a little. Uh, so there were multiple components to these summits. There was a daytime session and there was an evening session. So the daytime session was just an invite-only session, really meant to bring the experts into a room, hash out details, uh, discuss potential issues, new ideas, and to get uh, some more innovative research going, discussions going about innovative research, and to bring together potentially different aspects of the same field. Uh, in the evening, they had a public component, so the public was invited to come and listen to panel discussions, so there were some set up Q&A questions uh, ahead of time, but they also asked for input from the public, and those were kind of moderated through, uh, it wasn't a free-for-all, but they were moderated through um, uh, a couple of screeners, and then the panel was asked to comment on those, those questions. And then all of these four summits, the, at least the public component, they're available online. They were uh, videoed by the Hudson Valley Community College, which is up near us in uh, Rensselaer County. And so those you can go if you are glutton for punishment or you are tired and you want to go to sleep, you can put these on, they're about two hours each. So it's, <laughs> I'd say about four hours of Scott talking. Uh, and then the next component were the action plans. So this was done with a contractor, uh, contracting company. They took our large database that we've collected over you know, decades of work, uh, primarily through CSLAB and our LCI monitoring program, uh, and pulled out the data specific for these priority water bodies. Um, there's a, a background section, there's a host of information on pollution sources, they did uh, mapping, satellite mapping, uh, looking at chlorophyll levels, potentially predicting uh, whether or not blooms would be present. Um, they also did some statewide analyses from this database, as well as uh, the individual lake analyses. And there's also a, a large portion of the action plans are dedicated to looking at watershed management strategies and in-lake management strategies and identifying them as priorities uh, and tiered groups as well as long-term versus short-term strategies. And this was done in collaboration with local steering committees, so it wasn't just DEC in isolation saying this is what we think you should do in your watershed. We actually engaged the community and got feedback on what they thought was a priority as well and what was feasible for them, what they were most interested in. These are also all available on our website. Uh, you can just search Have Action Plans and it should bring you, it's one of the first or second um, results that comes up in Google. So the next component was what Scott refers to as the fun toys. Uh, this was the advanced monitoring pilot with USGS and this is ongoing work. Uh, we spent a lot of this year actually planning and preparing and the sensors were deployed, or the platforms were deployed this uh, midsummer. Uh, so we've got two advanced platforms built by USGS that were deployed in Nawasco Lake and Seneca Lake. Uh, they have uh, three multimeter probes at varying depths. They have uh, orthophyll phosphate probes. They have a multi-channel fluorometer. Uh, in 2019, they'll be adding cameras and MET stations to each of those platforms as well. So there's a host of information coming real time to this actual public-facing website from these lakes. Uh, and we've linked in some other buoys into the website as well. So this is actually like every you know, 15 minutes or so updating with the most recent information. So if you go to this, this link down here, it'll bring you to um, this website. Sorry, I actually clicked too quickly, but it'll bring you to this first website with a map of the Finger Lakes and the, the different buoy locations are these uh, flags here, and if you click on one, you'll be able to select the Get Data button. Uh, Skinny Atlas actually has a camera existing at the pier that's looking towards down towards the water to help potentially screen any bloom activity, which is one of the areas where we most frequently see blooms in Skinny Atlas. So this is a great screening tool. Uh, this will populate or pop up with this uh, next window, so you can select your station, you can select the different parameters that are being collected at that, at that platform. Uh, you can do a whole data set, you can do the past seven days, you can restrict it however you, you would like, and then it'll actually, in real time, create a graph for you, so you can look at a couple different parameters. Um, here I've selected, it 
looks like temperature and chlorophyll. Uh, I can't quite read that, but uh, just to show you, to demonstrate how it, it fills in the graph right away. And then you can also download this data and it, for that range you've selected and for those parameters, it'll download a CSV file which you could then manipulate. So all this is available to the public, which is really important for this project as well. Uh, so then the next, the last, next and last portion of the initiative is the mitigation pilots. So we implemented this this summer, 2018, on five water bodies. We selected five water bodies that were smaller in size compared to the priority water bodies for the initiative. They were not selected previously, but they still had a host of issues, particularly HABs, and they would be representative of a wider range of water quality uh, conditions around the state. So those five water bodies were selected, and then the strategies that would be most effective on those water bodies were then also selected with some input from our contractor. Uh, they were selected based on use, uh, history of HABs, the nutrient loading, uh, any existing management strategies in place, and we then decided to pilot which strategies uh, on which lakes. So hydrogen peroxide is a registered algicide in New York State, and we piloted that on three water bodies this year. Uh, we also chose an ultrasonic device and uh, put that on one water body. And then the strategies that we're evaluating this year are nutrient inactivants. So we didn't actually pilot inactivation, but we did do some assessments of two water bodies to see whether or not it would be suitable for nutrient loading in those lakes. So just a little background on how these three strategies work. Hydrogen peroxide, we have demonstrated in a variety of scenarios that this works for HAB mitigation. Uh, it breaks down into water and oxygen, so it's relatively innocuous to the environment. And it's a pretty quick degradation as well. Uh, it works through oxidation, so it oxidizes the algal cells as well as potentially the toxins. And we are somewhat hopeful that it will shift the community of the algae. So shifting from cyanobacteria potentially to a, a more healthy algae that we think will outcompete the cyanobacteria and keep it from rebounding. So that's what we see a lot with algicide treatments. Uh, you, know, you treat and then within a couple weeks the algae is grown back to a density that it shows up in a bloom again. Um, and while hydrogen peroxide we know works, it's incredibly expensive. So it's Ten, its tendency to be used in New York is pretty infrequent. Um, the second strategy, ultrasonic devices. So this we know has been used in New York, uh, but whether or not it works, we don't know. So we chose this smaller unit over here. This is a demonstration or a little depiction of what it looks like. Uh, there's a floatable to keep it in place. This is the unit below the surface. There's a navigation flag, and then this is the power source on, on land. The way that this supposedly works is it emits sound waves through the water column and that those sound waves then somehow damage the vacuoles, the gas vacuoles in the algae uh, that allow the algae to move throughout the water column. So to move vertically to, to uh, collect light at the surface and then to drop back down to the predation at night. Uh, so these potentially damage gas vacuoles without damaging the cell. Uh, that has yet to really be shown in the literature. There's some evidence of efficacy, but in really small uh, lab scenarios. So um, we wanted to see it in the field scenario. And also the potential impacts to non-target species are less known. So things other than cyanobacteria, do we want to strip the water column of all algae? No. Um, so looking at those kinds of things, was important to us as well. And then the final strategy, uh, nutrient inactivation. There's, this is widely used in, in drinking water supply, uh, treatment plants and uh, wastewater treatment plants. It's a way to sediment out the, uh, the particulate matter and organic matter in the water column, but when used in a lake strategy, it actually precipitates to the sediment and binds the phosphorus. So during anoxic stages of, of the lake, the Sediment can actually uh, release phosphorus back into the water column, uh, and this potentially loads the nutrient uh, load for next year. So you've, you've got this cycle of internal phosphorus loading, and it's legacy phosphorus that's not necessarily coming in each year, but it's been in the lake for years. Um, so this treatment strategy could block that 
that nutrient into the sediment for up to 10 or 15 years if used correctly in a proper dose. Um, so how did we actually implement? We did alternating weeks of treatment and monitoring on these lakes for both the hydrogen peroxide and the ultrasonic. The ultrasonic device was actually installed from the get-go, so it, it was just on the, throughout the entire treatment. But every two weeks we'd go out and, well, not we, but the contractor would go out and treat. And every the alternating weeks they would go out and collect water samples and do a host of things, looking at um, uh, perception surveys, macrophytes, uh, they do lab analysis on, on the water samples as well. And we did it, the treatments in two kind of batches. There was half lake treatment, which is pretty typical of an algicide, and in particular hydrogen peroxide. We also tried to do a different strategy, which would be targeted beach applications. So smaller three acre areas, we just put the hydrogen peroxide directly on those beaches to see if there could be beneficial impact to the beach area, swimming area alone. Uh, these were the monitoring parameters. I won't go through all of them, but they're pretty typical of what you would do for your general lake monitoring anyways. Uh, and then for the evaluation for the nutrient inactivants, we don't have the whole host of data yet, but we did the same thing, monitoring every two weeks. We did this for eight sessions in, in regards to uh, comparison to six for the hydrogen peroxide. And then ultimately we'll use this data in combination with sediment core analysis, bathymetry, um, there were a couple other things that they collected while they were out this, this summer to see if the lake is even a candidate for nutrient inactivation. Uh, if so, which product? There's a variety of products on the market to use. And then at what dose? Because you, you want to dose appropriately for the load that's in the sediment as well as the water quality conditions. Um, so again, we don't have all of the data yet. The project's just wrapped up about last month. Um, so, but ultimately we'll be looking at whether or not these strategies were effective and their uh, suggested mechanism from, from the literature, from the, uh, from the company who, who makes the products. Uh, and then we'll also see what other work might need to be done because we might not have the answers yet. So, uh, kind of a whole host of things that still need to go on. And then just as an aside, for the company that wrote the action plans and did the statewide and the uh, have the water body specific analyses, they're also continuing their work with us to dig deeper into our data set. Uh, we are exploring some more complex combinations and interactions of different variables. We're including more land uses, different uh, meteorological data, and we're also looking at some of the non have 12 lakes. So lakes that potentially have been in sea slab for decades and have really extensive water quality data, but we just didn't have the time the first round to go ahead and delve into what could potentially be impacting their lakes um, and what could be driving halves. So these are just some of the results that we found so far, uh, looking at the occurrence, the so presence, absence of a bloom, and the persistence, how many weeks that bloom was present. Uh, things Scott has probably mentioned previously in other presentations, but we statistically demonstrated through these analyses. Obviously, phosphorus is a driver. Fetch is a driver. Um, zebra mussels, the orientation of the lake, so a northwest orientation seemed to be significant. Uh, the longer, so that kind of in, works in conjunction with weather, you know, you've got wind direction, you've got a northwest orientation of the lake, and then you've got miles of buildup potentially for the bloom to accumulate. So that's, um, all of that proved to be significant. And then also we saw that the, uh, the, land, the watershed in developed land in the watershed was significantly associated with the persistence of HABs. Um, and also, interestingly, nitrogen played a pretty big role on toxicity. So I know that went kind of long, but um, I guess we'll turn it over to questions about this or questions about anything else. Um, overall, question and answer session, okay. I think, is what we had planned. So we've uh, had a lot of great <laughs> Great uh, inputs from the speakers.